Memorial Lecture in Gender and Sexuality Studies. I'm Sean Resolutes, and along Alright, and welcome everybody. I'm Patrick Smith, I teach in the Department of World Languages and Literature in WGS at BU. Let me start um, by saying that this is part of a new book project, um, and that's the title To Be Real, um, The Passion of the Self in Queer Writing. Um, and it does address the way that a field deeply influenced by post structuralism and its questioning of both the self and the real dealt with material realities, questions of the body, desire, violence, sex, and death. Um, some of you may recognize the origin of the title, um, taken from the 1978 Cheryl Lynn hit, Got to Be Real, released in 1978 and tuned to the frequency of the dance floor. I'm not referring only to its 115 beats per minute 4 4 rhythm or to Lynn's miraculous vocal stylings, um, but the song also traps the euphoria and the fast moving intimacy of the dance floor. Uh, in this world, what you feel now very quickly becomes what you know to be real. And if one moment, I think I love you, it is not long before I decide that our love is here to stay. Uh, I think I'm going to do that kind of thing I've seen people do, but I'm not a hero. This is not my dream up here. <laughs> um, okay, um, I won't drop the mic though, I promise. <laughs> um, the song though celebrates and puts interpretive pressure on realness. It's got to be real, but that is not what pop mega hits or the disco or disco nightlife is known for. The song ends up with Lynn repeatedly um, repeating, it's time to be real. It's time to be real, it's time to be real. Yes, in 1978, it was time to be <laughs> real. Um, that's why Sandra Bernhardt begins her free at last monologue in Without Know Nothing with the line, okay, pretend it's 1978 and you're straight. <laughs> um, if you know the monologue, you know that you're not straight for very long. Lights, Sylvester, poppers, boom, you're not straight. <laughs> Lynn's anthem demands that its listeners get real. That is to say, obey the evidence of your senses, pay attention to what, what you feel now, be open to what you find, and experience real love. The fact that love could be experienced under the um, unreal lights of a disco ball does not make it less real. For many people, it was the first real love that they had known. But it does um, affect the definition of reality. The dual status of real in the song pre presumably led to its inclusion in Paris' Burning. In that documentary, Got to Be Real, after all, um, realness is similarly raked over the interpretive poles. In ball culture, contesting, uh, con contestants walking the realness category have got to be real. And that's to say, they've got to be proximate, they've got to approximate cisgender femininity, but what then is realness? To be real, the book explores a defining paradox in queer writing, which both undermines the real, but also insists on it. There are many ways to describe this dynamic, but let me offer one version as a uh, short phrase C. The rise of queer theory around 1990 occurs in tandem with two intellectual movements, post-structuralism and identity politics. The combination of philosophical skepticism about identity on the one hand and investment in minority experience on the other is the, signal, is the signature of queer writing. Since its inception, queer criticism has been been known for its rigorous interrogation of the grounds of personhood, 
but is also known for its renovation of academic style in the direction of the personal. Early critics broke with scholarly convention to include narrative, slang, obscenity, song lyrics, um, and passages of uh, heightened emotion. The tension between subjectless critique and self-revelation is everywhere in the field, but it has mostly gone unnoticed, or unremarked, let's say. It is visible in two signal statements from early, the early 1990s, Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, um, in which she cites uh, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's dictum that there is no doer behind the deed to question the grammar of the self. At almost the same time, Cedric countered a century of writing about homosexuality from clinical distance, arguing that, quote, queer can only properly signify in the first person. In the book, I address this tension, um, which insists um, at once on the undermining of the self and on the personal and on personal revelation, honesty, and authenticity as values. Um, so I think, you know, I'm citing the subject there, but I think for those of you who, who know her work, it's clear how deeply indebted this project is to her, um, in that she's sort of responsible for the growth of the field as we know it. Um, relentless, it's relentless questioning of the truisms of identity and of taking for granted distinctions between gay and straight, male and female, and so on, um, that it seemed before her writing and the writing of her peers um, beyond critique. But she also insisted, particularly in her turn to affect and embodiment, that it's got to be real. Today, I will explore uh, questions of reality and truth in Cedric's work, particularly in relation to David Kernick's 2020 call to get real, um, in, to, for the field to get real, uh, about the moral seriousness of queer theory. I will then turn to a classic essay in queer trans theory from the early 1990s, that's to say Susan Stryker's My Words to Victor Frankenstein about the village of Chamonix performing transgender rage to explore what I see as this defining tension um, in more detail. Okay, um, so uh, I'll take those in two parts. Um, part one is called, What If She Meant It? What If It's True? David Kernick's 2020 essay, A Few Lies, Queer Theory and Our, Our Method Melodramas, um, is primarily uh, an interrogation of what he sees as the melodramatic nature of the method wars or reading uh, method debates in literary studies. He sees in this miniature tradition uh, a mistaken and contemptuous view of the work that literary critics actually do, one that is dangerously in league with a general contempt, contempt for academic criticism in humanities. A key problem in, this, in his view with texts like Rita Felsky's The Limits of Fatigue, um, or Sharon Marcus and Stephen Best's essay on surface reading, is that they actually do not address reading methods. Instead, they offer what Kernick um, repeatedly calls characterology, by which he means that these essays do not engage with actual reading, but instead um, paint critics and theorists as particular kinds of people. Um, and the kinds of people they are is not good. essays. <laughs> 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 Um, what are critics like? Well, they're arrogant, suspicious, aggressive, um, grandiose, paranoid. For Kernick, this is a problem both because it adds fuel to the fire currently burning down our profession, but also it significantly mischaracterizes the project of queer criticism. Queer criticism is central to such um, state of the field debates in literary studies because, well, many of the people who, who work in, in these, who write in, on these debates um, 
identify as queer or other parts of their work have dealt with LGBT issues or whatever, but also because um, queer criticism, queer theory has largely set the terms for several of these debates. And yet, as Karen points out, so many um, indications of queer criticism are diminishing or trivializing of its arguments. Queer thought is bound up with the uh, with methods debates, with the method debates, it has, as Karen argues, long engaged with just the questions that are central to these debates, um, such as the moods of criticism, the relationship between textual analysis and activism and reading. Um, in the words uh, and, and reading in the words of Charles Dickens as via D.A. Miller, reading as if for life. Um, these are questions that have been central to queer theory, but also come up in the method debates. But it's the deletion of AIDS as a, an animating um, context for queer thought that is um, the hot is at the hot center of Karnik's essay, If He Lies. Uh, Karnik is um, takes the title A Few Lies from the opening line of Leo Burstein's 1987 essay, Is the Right Room a Grave? We have been telling a few lies. Let's see if we want. Bersani was debunking what he saw as the idealization of gay sex as democratizing and egalitarian um, in the context of the AIDS emergency. Karnik places Bersani in a tradition of queer truth telling that he links to the um, get over it, get over yourself uh, atmosphere of the gay bar, but also to the AIDS crisis. Reflecting on the history of the field, Koenig emphasizes that the field, um, the field's reputation for style and postmodern play does not acknowledge its other moods and uh, tones. He writes, Revisit the common and critical work produced in gay lesbian studies in the 80s and 90s. And it's striking, if entirely unsurprising, how frequently the names of the recently dead are invoked in the writing of Ian Miller, Sabina Mercer, Douglas Trent, Jeff Nukawa, Garen Dinshaw, Robert B. Farr, Patricia White, Cindy Patton, Bersani, Philip Ryan Harper, Lee Edelman, Eve Cedric, David Halpern, Robin Weaven, Thomas Gingling, not only in the objects of their inquiry, but in the matrix of their acknowledgments, footnotes, dedications. Uh, the, the dominant affects are sorrow and rage, and, and when style or wit are deployed, as they often are, they are scored with those emotions. Cedric is a key figure here, but her place in Karnik's article um, is complex. On the one hand, Cedric gave rise to the um, gave rise to the method wars, and in the form that um, Karnik excoriates. So he sees behind um, Felsky and Bastian Marcus, he sees um, Cedric's essay um, on Karnik's record of reading. Um, with that essay, Paranoid Margaret Reading, or You're So Paranoid, you probably think this essay is about you, um, Cedric opened an investigation into reading methods um, that was, as Karnik and others have noted, not so much about method as it was about um, ethics, psychology, mood, um, and uh, disposition. For Karnik, this is, um, a problem, and he calls it a melodrama because it pits, uh, Cedric does say, pits a glowering, paranoid reader against a loving, attentive, generous reader who only seeks to repair. Such simplification uh, misses both the mixed emotion of criticism and the mixed motives of critics. Karnik is particularly disappointed with Cedric in this regard because um, he looks to her for just the opposite impulse, um, he writes. 
There are no doubt uh, connections to be drawn among a critic's psychic orientation towards the world, the hermeneutic tools she deploys when engaged in literary interpretation, and the effect the reading she, the reading she produces has on readers, students, and the discipline uh, for which she uh, for which her words uh, may become decisive. But those relationships are tortuous. Um, and Cedric is elsewhere one of our best theorists of the twisty affective energies that flow between a psychology and a text, a text and a method, um, a reading and an audience. But even more than the melodramatizing of method in uh, apparently reading and reference reading, Carnegie bemoans the displacement of AIDS as an urgent uh, reality in the essay. The essay begins, as well known, with a recorded dialogue between Cedric and Cindy Patton, who suggests that determining whether or not um, HIV was a clandestine plot moved by the US military is not an urgent concern. Well, what would we know then that we don't already know, Patton asks? The point is that whether or not we adopt a paranoid view of the AIDS epidemic, we would still do the same things to fight it. Um, activist methods remain the same. For Cedric, this is a lesson in the performativity of knowledge. It is far less important to establish truth in an abstract sense than to consider what truth or knowledge can make happen. But it is also a pivot point in the essay, as Carney points out. Um, moving it away from the question of what is to be done to the question of what do we feel. Given that it does, given that it, does, given that it does make a difference in our actions, whether we are paranoid or not, is it better to be paranoid or to undertake the work of psychic repair? This is not Patton's question, but it has become ours. To the extent that Cedric's focus on the performativity of knowledge and on affect has led to a, a disregard um, of AIDS as a material condition for the emergence of a field, Carnage pushes back. Contesting the accepted timeline of the affective turn in both queer and, and literary studies, Carnick writes, quote, this genealogy might well be, pushing, be pushed further back, at least a decade before the word affect achieved discipline-wide currency. The AIDS catastrophe had given criticism the thing itself. Uh, so long before everyone was doing affect criticism, the AIDS crisis had given, given us affect. Um, and furthermore, the trace of it is, is all over all of our queer criticism of the period. In place of affect studies, kind of suggests real feeling, real rage, and grief about AIDS. Real feeling is an evidence here in Carnick's anger, in, in here in, I mean in Carnick's essay, in his anger against the use of AIDS as an example in Cedric's essay alongside what he sees as it, the, mm, it, it, the essay's failure to address AIDS, quote, as a historical condition for the moods of queer criticism. That is to say, to, count, uh, to account for how critical moods are not exemplary ethical positions or stances, but rather are produced in relation to historical events, produced by historical events, you could say. Chronic resists an understanding of performativity that would displace questions of the truth. In this spirit, he criticizes the tendency to regard Cedric's early work as a preeminent example of Karen's style in queer criticism. Rather, Karnick defends epistemology of the closet from the charge, frequent charge, of paranoia. The book is not characterized, he argues, by dark imaginings. Quote, 
that the major modes of thought and knowledge um, in 20th century Western culture as a whole are structured, indeed fractured, by a chronic, now endemic crisis of homo hetero definition. Sorry, that's, that's just me quoting the beginning of, of a small closet. Um, uh, Kronik does not see that as a paranoid fantasy. Rather, um, in his account, Cedric is a careful diagnostician of this state of affairs, a true state of affairs in Kronik's telling. Regarding her outsized claims at the opening of this homology, he asks twice, what if she meant it? What if it's true? Early in a few lives, Kearney asserts, it's difficult to think of a contemporary field of critical theory whose rhetorical um, arsenal relies so centrally on the speech act of calling bullshit. Kernick is, of course, joining this tradition, calling bullshit on, quote, our method melodramas, um, the deletion of AIDS as the origin of queer thought, and, as I'm suggesting, on at least certain versions of the turn to affect um, and, rep and reparation in queer criticism. Now, I'm utterly magnetized by Kernick's argument. You can probably tell because I've talked about it this <laughs> entire time. Um, um, and I do see it as an urgent intervention, both in the ongoing AIDS crisis and kind of cultural criticism around that, um, but also in the material conditions in which we all may work, study, teach. Um, but um, uh, it's maybe because I'm so magnified by this argument that I um, have not uh, considered my own place in relation to this. Um, as Dr. said, I, I work in ethnic studies and <laughs> methods. Um, so uh, I'm going to do that for a second and just to say, um, Rita Felsky, along with Jonathan Bradley, was my dissertation chair. Um, I'm a long time collaborator of Stephen Best and Sharon Marcus. Um, and, you know, furthermore, I'm, I'm closely associated with, um, with both the affective turn and the reading debates and literary studies. Um, uh, furthermore, David Carnick is the dedicatee of feeling backward, and he's my best friend. So, um, <laughs> surprise, I'm pretty implicated. <laughs> um, but I, I really love this essay. Um, and um, I'm mostly just reading alongside him here, but I do want to speak up on behalf of affect studies. Um, while it has sometimes failed to reckon with the thing itself, um, this field has also gotten it right sometimes, and significantly, it has opened the space to have the kind of discussion that I'm having with, with David here. Um, I wanted to direct us by way of a defense of ethics studies to a different moment in apparently reading and, and record of reading, um, when Cedric revisits the reality of AIDS, not from the perspective of knowledge, but from the perspective of feeling. Um, reflecting on the brutal for, for, foreshortening of so many queer lifespans, Cedric considers the affects of the self and one's sense of time uh, living in this reality. Um, she writes uh, about two younger friends, one living with HIV and one with cancer, in relationship to her own breast cancer diagnosis. It's hard to say, hard even to know um, how these relationships are different from those shared by people of different ages on a landscape where perspectival lines converge on a common um, disappearing point. I'm sure ours, her and her friends, are more intensely motivated. Whatever else we know, we know there isn't time to bullshit. 
but what it means to identify with each other must also be very different. On this scene, an older person doesn't love a younger person as someone who will someday um, be where she now is, or vice versa. No one is, so to speak, passing on the family name. There is a sense in which our life, our life narratives will barely overlap. There's another sense in which they slide up more intimately alongside one another than, than any lives that are moving forward according to the regular schedule of the generations. At the end of this essay, which Karnick sees as sidelining the material reality of AIDS and therefore falling down on the job of calling bullshit, Cedric asserts, under the pressure of impending death, that um, she realizes that there isn't time to bullshit. Cedric's clear-eyed naming of her condition, living with advanced breast cancer, and of her likely odds, I have little chance of living to be 60, she writes, stands as a reminder of the other, less danceable ways we are writing gets real. One may have qualms, certainly, about Cedric's penchant for cross-identification, active as ever in the equivalence she suggests between uh, her own breast cancer diagnosis and um, her friend living with HIV. Uh, the question of how to make sense of the intensity of Cedric's identifications is only compounded, not resolved, by noting that this line in her essay repeats almost word for word um, a moment in David Wolnerovich's uh, enraged response to the death of his friend Peter Gujar in uh, Living Close to the Knife, written in 1991, published in 1991. Or one may critique Cedric's lack of attention to other forms of um, cruel foreshortening of life, um, loss to poverty, migration, or state violence, although Cedric herself mentions um, the uninsured people in dangerous industries and those lost to racist violence. But the fact that, the, that Cedric invokes HIV AIDS in a, a consummately material way, invoking the shaping power of mortality, that's the, the fact is that she invokes it in that way, is presumably in this mood of there being no time for bullshit that Cedric has written paranoid reading and record of reading. She means it. What if it's true? Okay, uh, now it's part two, um, <laughs> which is called Hear My Tale. Um, it has an epigraph, this section, which is called, uh, which reads, This book is not a memoir. And that's the opening line from the introduction to Paul Preciado's Testo Gempi from 2008. Okay, to so examine thinking about both queer performativity and queer authenticity, I now turn to Stryker, Susan Stryker's 1994 essay, No Words to Victor Frankenstein, of the Village of Chamonix, Performing Transgender Rage, published in an early issue of DLQ. It's a good fit in this issue, I'd say, because Stryker addresses many of the key concepts of early queer theory performativity, the critique of the sovereign subject and what Cedric later referred to as faith and exposure um, as a political strategy. The conceptual energy of the essay is matched by the power of Stryker's use of her own body and story. My words begins with an anecdote that finds Stryker giving a, performative, uh, a performance lecture at a conference called Rage Across Disciplines um, that's a big name, right? Um, <laughs> Rage Plus Disciplines held at Cal State San Marcos in the summer of 1993. The performance challenges both gender norms and the forms of academic behavior, the norms of academic behavior. Um, so this is the opening of that essay. Um, and Stryker recalls her place at the, uh, her appearance at the left turn. I stood at the podium wearing gender-fucked drag, 
combat boots, threadbare Levi 501s over a black lace bodysuit, a shredded transgender nation t-shirt with the neck and sleeves cut out, a pink triangle quartz crystal pendant, grunge metal jewelry, and a six inch, a six inch long marlin hook dangling around my neck in a length of heavy stainless steel chain. I decorated the set by draping my black leather biker jacket over my hair, over my chair um, at the panelist's uh, table. The jacket had hand handcuffs on the left shoulder, uh, rainbow freedom rings on the right, on the right side lacings, and queer nation style stickers reading sex change, dyke, and fuck your transphobia postered, plastered on the back. Okay. <laughs> um, so the scene is meant to shape the audience as well as the reader, something it still, I would argue, has the power to do, um, although uh, now the shock of time travel is added to the original shock of um, Stryker's appearance, I would say, um, because it, it's really a sort of time capsule of the early 1990s. Stryker argues that she crafted this uh, performance guided by the desire not to use uh, not just to talk about gender fuck, but actually to do it, actually fuck gender. Her self-presentation is one of proud defiance, although the details are also um, insignia of belonging to transgender nation, to queer nation, and to the army of lovers who incited the queer revolution. Stryker shows her allegiance to the new field of queer theory as well, perhaps most obviously the essay is notable for its extreme acts of reverse discourse. Stryker writes that her status as a transsexual means that her very existence um, is bound up with, the, with techno science, um, such that she is seen as less than human, um, a monster. Rather than disavow this label, however, um, Stryker inhabits it, citing precedents such as the rec rec reclamation of terms like dyke, fag, queer, slut, and whore for, for, for progressive ends. She argues that words like creature, monster, and unnatural need to be reclaimed by the transgender community. By embracing and accepting such words, she continues, we have we can we may dispel the, their ability to harm us. Stryker risks being identified with the non-human, even the non-organic, as she proposes reframing monster in particular by recalling its etymological roots to warn, recasting the figure um, not as a debased creature, but as a harbinger of transformation. Stryker also draws heavily on Judith Butler's concept of gender performativity and the model of politics it envisions, particularly the model of politics it envisions. Stryker suggests that, the, that trans people, by inhabiting gender as unnatural, illuminate the performative and um, constructed nature of all gender and thus have a role in the remaking of society. In Gender Trouble, Butler argues that the appearance of non-normative gender in the case, in her case, she's thinking primarily about drag and which femme, could shape gender's general faith in the naturalness and stability of gender categories. The appearance of gender non-normativity, its recognition as such, can loosen the hold that gender norms have on everyone. <laughs> Stryker argues along similar lines in my words, drawing attention to the way that the violence of gender assignment is made manifest uh, by the presence of trans, transsexuals, trans people. She writes, to encounter the transsexual body, to apprehend a transgendered um, consciousness, um, articulating itself is to risk a revelation of the constructiveness of the natural order. Showing gender to be a made thing and the product of violence is something that transsexuals do by their very presence. Just as Frankenstein's monster 
um, unsettles the taken for granted naturalness of the, of the human. Confronting this fact is, is a heroic act and it's something that Stryker calls on her readers to do, um, uh, employing the agreed prophetic tone used by Shelley's preacher. Um, this is, gives you just a sense of the, the kind of rhetorical performance um, that uh, Stryker engages in throughout the, um, the, uh, the, this article. Hearken unto me, fellow creatures, I who have uh, dwelt in a form unmatched with my desire, um, I whose flesh has become an assemblage of incongruous uh, and anatomical parts, I who achieved the sim similitude of a natural body only through an uh, unnatural process, I offer you this warning. The nature you bedevil me with is a lie. Do not trust it um, to protect you from what I represent, for it is a fabrication that cloaks the groundlessness of the privilege you seek to maintain for yourself at my expense. You are as constructed as me, the same anarchic womb has birthed us both. I call upon you to investigate your nature as I have been compelled to um, compelled to confront mine. Um, I challenge you to risk abjection and flourish as well as, as have I. Heed my words and you may well discover the seams and sutures in yourself. Um, theoretically and politically, Stryker's argument meshes perfectly with Butler's in which perception of a fracture in sex gender system throws all gender forms, all gender norms into crisis, uh, resulting, at least ideally, in the discovery of gender's groundlessness. It strikes as people can be made to see the scenes and sutures in themselves to refuse the naturalness of gender norms to loosen gender uh, categories then it will make life much more livable for everyone. But if a theory is familiar from Butler's work um, of the late 80s and early 90s, the theatrical stance is not at all. Stryker adopts the grating cadences and grandiose postures, um, that's her phrase, of the Gothic anti-hero adopting both the persona of Frankenstein's creature and the occasion of his address to his maker. Um, quote, I want to lay claim the dark power of my monstrous identity. Stryker writes, channeling what she calls uh, transgender rage. Both the intensity of her queer fury and the stormy rhetoric um, put Stryker at a great distance from norms of academic discourse. In this regard, the essay forms part of a wave of experiments that characterize writing by the first generation of queer critics who, and Michael Warner, uh, in Michael Warner's words, described as um, seeking to mess up the desexualized spaces of the academy, um, exude some rut, and reimagine the public's from for which academic intellectuals write, dress, and perform. In a section called Diary, February 18th, 1993, uh, this section occupies the center of the essay, and in it, Stryker describes a scene in the hospital where her lover gives birth to their child. Um, um, in the hospital, they are accompanied by their, quote, little tribe, a mix of family members, non-biological kin, the midwife, and the baby, and the baby's father. The moment of gendering the newborn, it's a girl, brings on a major crisis for Stryker, which hits her only where, when she returns home alone. Um, and this is uh, taken from the diary. This describes her coming home from this kind of joyous, exemplary scene in the hospital. 
Um, and she writes, finally, in the solitude of my home, I burst apart like a wet paper bag and spilled the contents, uh, and spilled the emotional contents of my life through my hands, through the cupped hand, the hands I cupped like a sieve over my face. For days, as I had accompanied my partner on her journey, I had been progressively opening myself and preparing to let go of whatever um, was deepest within. Now everything in me flowed out, moving up from inside and out through my throat, my mouth, because these things could never pass through the lips of my tongue. Now, this moment could not be more different from Stryker's opening appearance um, on the podium in the essay. There, she is arrayed for a public performance, her grief transformed into activist rage, fuck your transphobia. Here, in the most private section of the essay, the diary, Stryker describes her passing emotions, um, joy in new life, love for her partner, pride in their alternative family, but she also describes what it is to hit joy's limit. Sometimes, though, I still, I still mourn the passing of old, more familiar ways, she begins, and uh, recalls her uh, former marriage, um, asking, uh, how did that little Mormon boy from Oklahoma, uh, I used to be, grow up to be a transsexual leather guy in San Francisco? <laughs> Stryker continues, home was so far behind me, it was gone forever, and here, and there was no place to rest. Battered by heavy emotions, a little dazed, I felt the immense, the, I felt the inner walls that protect me dissolving, dissolve to leave me vulnerable to all that could harm me. I cried and abandoned myself to abject despair over what gender had done to me. No more proud exile, the diary finds Stryker battered by heavy weather, um, overwhelmed by the violence of gender. Yet here it is not clear if it's the violence of socially enforced gender norms uh, that is the problem. What looms on the horizon is a more pervasive violence of gender, one that can only be, uh, with, one that may be impervious to activist rage or to transformation. Such a bottoming out of tone, though surprising in a work of critical gender theory, is hardly to be avoided in an essay that claims to claims the subject position um, of Frankenstein's monster. Things don't end well for <laughs> um, <laughs> Although the preacher um, is capable of rage, even murderous rage, as well as defiance and disdain. His words to Victor Frankenstein about the village of Chamonix are perhaps more notable for their plaintive quality. Hear my tale, the preacher both begs and commands Dr. Frankenstein. He goes on to describe his situation as one intoler of intolerable isolation, nearly universal rejection, and longing for companionship. But these are not merely social ills. Like Stryker, um, in her lowest moments, the preacher feels that nature itself is conspiring against him, for it is not uh, a misunderstanding um, that the world rejects Frankenstein's preacher. As the preacher sees it, uh, and sees um, the situ their, his situation, his exile is deserved, the, ine the inevitable effect of his hideous appearance. While the preacher looks the part of Milton Satan, a giant roaming through the icy caverns and the snowy peaks of the Alps, his discourse often shows him to be uh, dependent, abject, cringing, um, afflicted by self-doubt and even self-loathing. Again and again, the preacher looks um, with fondness on, quote, old, more familiar ways, idealizing forms of ordinary human society from which he is absolutely excluded. In this, Frank, in this sense, Frankenstein's creature suffers a, a form of social isolation fastened to the community that rejects him. 
Um, he's, you know, he, he, he loves the cottagers most of all, and that's where he could never be. What is worse for him is that he approves the standards by which he is rejected. Um, this is the key difference between the creature and uh, the first person narrator of Stryker's essay. In her lowest moments, she idealizes more familiar ways and wonders what happened to the little Mormon boy from Oklahoma. But Stryker recovers herself and realizes that she likes being a transsexual leather dyke um, in San Francisco. The same cannot be said for Shelley's creature, who is, to his eternal chagrin, uh, fundamentally alone. Going to, Satan, going to San Francisco or to hell won't help him because he is one of a kind. There is no alternative community of leather dykes or fallen angels um, out there waiting for him. Striker self exposure, striker self exposure still have the power to shock, and they uh, resonate in the present. It was risky for Striker to reveal um, her, rain, her rage not only at society but also at some conditions of her transgender life and embodiment. The scene in the hospital room is an instance of utopian alternative kinship, and the uh, scene um, at the lectern, one of powerful conversion of personal experience into public speech and, and into a collective space. But in addition to these two moments, Stryker reveals much thornier and even quasi-taboo feelings longing for a normative past and despair about not being able to give birth to a child, the essay would still be powerful without the inclusion of these moments, but I see this as Stryker making good on her identification with the monster, as making reflections about the social um, contract and the general will with his, as he, um, attest to the intense pain of his isolation. In tracing this tradition back to back this far, we can also trace back its defining ambivalence about the subject. Since it's Frankenstein, since in Frankenstein it is the creature that um, it is the creature that hideous parody of man uh, who gives voice to its consummately human uh, lament. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Change our reality, and yet, you know, transphobia, homophobia, homophobia these are very um, pernicious and long lasting feelings. And, you know, of course, also in this moment, like, we know that, you know, laws are just can be changed back or whatever, and that's, that's really what's happening. So, um, so I, you know, I think, I think that, yeah, there are certain ways in which. Um, this piece shows itself as being written in the early 90s um, in terms of its sort of um, way of handling uh, certain questions of trans self-announcement and representation. Um, but I feel that it is certainly as urgent as, as it has ever been in a political context um, and also that, you know, I see a great continuity in those feelings, but, you know, people aren't going to agree with me because I see continuity in feelings from, like, you know, 1895. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a bit of an outlier on this point, I guess, but, you know, I'm also, I'm also a literary historian, so I tend to believe in the past pretty strongly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do think it is out of sync with certain norms, but I, um, I take, um, I take great, um, I take great solace from that fact, and I and I and I kind of believe in sort of presenting that work publicly because I really I believe in in, in her project and what she's doing, and I think it's important. So, um, and if anything, you know, sorry to go on and on about this, but I was just thinking about about um, Sontag's Sontag. Sorry, I'm also teaching lit medicine, so I've been teaching Sontag as well. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of Stryker's later writing about this essay, um, you know, she's really I think doubled down on the posthumanism of the piece, um, partly in relationship to some critiques about the kind of um, 
uh, whiteness of the, the article that's it's been critiqued for that, for um, sort of her unthinking use of, of color, the, the term color, the word color, but also the way that despair is linked to um, blackness and darkness throughout the piece. Um, and so she's thinking about that, and, and, and the way she responds to that is partly by sort of going back to Sandy Stone and kind of tracing this um, sort of post-humanist kind of lineage. Um, but for me, that's a bit ironic, really, you know, and that's partly why I have the Paul Preciado quote there, because I do think Paul Preciado didn't write a memoir. Like, I do think it is something else. It's a kind of post-humanist record of experience, but not really a memoir. But I just think it's sort of ironic to claim like the post-humanism of this piece that's based on identification of very human feeling with um, with Shelley's monster, who is kind of the ultimate romantic hero and sort of the, you know all too human. Um, so uh, yes, Shakespeare's creature, Shelley's creature is literally not human and is a monster. Um, but I don't think that that makes the piece not humanist um, in a significant way. So those are a lot of my feelings about that piece. But, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about any, any piece of this. So. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a question over there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I can't see, so just talk. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about you, you kind of pulled out these threads of like um, kind of like queer negativity that are really interesting to me, especially in this moment of um, just kind of like uh, unprecedented uh, uh, legal attacks against uh, queer subjectivity. Yeah. Um, and it's from the legal realm. But also, um, I'm, I'm I was really fascinated with your quoting of uh, Preciado's. Uh, Testo Junkie, because he also talks about how his gender doesn't belong to the state or to the feminist movement or really to anyone at all in, in, in keeping with that kind of post humanist strain. Right. So, uh, my question is basically do you think there's a real moment for gender negativity now in turning back to auto theory and to turn back to um, kind of the formations of queer theory today? Okay, I was following you until you asked your question because, well, one thing is like auto theory seems to me so recent as to like turning back to it seems a bit, I mean, it's a very recent point in age, right? So, um, so I'm hardly confused by that, but I also, can you just repeat the question? Sorry. No, it's okay. It's yeah, okay. Um, so my, my question is more of in turning to auto theory today as this kind of new, um, this new movement, yeah. are we perhaps seeing an, kind of like a uh, use of earlier methods? It kind of like if we if we see people using, say, methods that say reference Preciado, mm -hmm. um, is there uh, a sort of um, usefulness in queer negativity today? Mm -hmm. um, in auto theory, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you see threads between auto theory today um, and the formations of queer theory in the past? Yes, I do. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit, I, I haven't been like writing or really thinking very hard about Preciado until recently, so I'm a bit like, um, I have to say I'm a bit up in the air about that. I don't see Preciado, I see Preciado as quite different, and I don't see um, Preciado as sort of setting the terms for queer auto theory, auto theory or trans auto theory today exactly. Like, I do think the book is quite different. Um, and I see most art theory as I would characterize as a kind of, you know, I don't think memoir would be far off, a kind of intellectual memoir, a kind of mashup of, of theory and, and memoir. Um, whereas I do think Preciado has a very different project. So um, I would just say that, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested, I'm, well, like everybody else, it seems like I'm interested in art theory right now, but, um, but I, I'm also, I guess I'm, I, one of the one of the motivations for this project, um, besides my kind of interest in, in all of these different writers, these amazing writers, and trying to think how they were sort of managing what seems to me a, a kind of intellectual representational problem. Like I am just interested in that. Um, but one of the motivations is that um, people are so often saying um, about auto theory, like, oh, it is queer. Like auto theory is queer. And of course, you know. Um, like my struggle, like is not 
queer. I mean, there's plenty of examples that where you're like, that's not, that doesn't make sense. But, but nonetheless, it's something that people do do say a lot, and you know, partly has to do with the the sort of success of the Argonauts and things like that. But, um, but there is this idea that um, that there's a kind of natural fit. Of, you know, I don't mean to say natural in some frigid way, but a, you know, a kind of progression uh, uh, without disruption between between queer writing. Um, between say feminist writing, uh, personal is political, queer writing with you know some of the kind of effects that I'm talking about in the talk, um, and auto theory today. And I what I want to what I want to do is to trouble that um, to trouble that connection because um, it seems to me that um, really to to see a kind of seamless fit between uh, moments of, of personal revelation or, or self-exposure, um, or even just anecdote in a way in, in queer theory with um, the theory itself, um, seems to me to miss the, all of the kind of animated tension and the contradiction there. Like, I don't think that was ever a sort of natural fit um, in sort of early 90s queer theory. So. Um, so I, I want it to not, I, and I think a lot of the same kind of tensions bedevil, not bedevil, I'm <laughs> using such, um, my language is often infected by, by Stryker and <laughs> by Mary Shelley before that, but um, the, the tensions that, you know, I don't see it such a natural fit in auto theory either. Um, I mean, so, you know, I mean, for instance, the use of, of the kind of textual form of, um, a lover's discourse for the Argonauts. Um, when when Bart was such, I mean, Bart was trafficking in self-revelation. Obviously, we know so much about about Bart's self, um, and yet so excoriating um, at so many points of the sort of cliches of personhood, and you know, really this deep structuralist thinker. Um, so that you know, his writing in fragments or his, you know, it, it had a kind of it had a kind of aesthetics and a, and a politics and a, an intellectual force behind it that um, I think you know has been sort of erased or smoothed over um, in its uptake in in the Argonauts. Um, I'm not really trying to criticize the Argonauts. I'm just saying that I, I think that sort of naturalization of that progression is is tricky. And so you know I'm interested. I mean I am really interested in the Argonauts. Uh, like I thought a lot about it, but I. I think that the sort of coming together there of um, like a, a more seamless kind of integration of the personal and political, which I associate with the kind of feminist tradition of writing, like look at Adrian Rich, look at Audre Lorde, like there's not uh, this uh, intellectual contradiction for me, there's actually an intellectual uh, explanation and a reason and justification for um, self-revelation in a lot of that writing. Um, so I think it takes up that tradition, um, and then there's another sort of tradition which I, you know, have worked on a lot in late 19th and early 20th century of sort of queer disappearance. You know, it's more associated with the gay, gay male tradition. It's not only there, but uh, you know, of a kind of um, withdrawal or disappearance. You know, cater wild, etc., with sort of flashes of uh, signaling the self. You know, and that's a survival mechanism in a homophobic society, but I think it's also a writing style. Um, and so I'm thinking about sort of trying to dis disaggregate, not because I you know, don't live those things together, but, but I think heuristically it makes sense to kind of think about these different traditions of handling the personal and get some more um, sort of clarity on how we, how, what we mean when we say that people use the personal in their writing, because I think there's such a, a wide, uh, a really truly wide range of, of ways that people uh, deploy the personal, and it means different things in these different contexts. So that's kind of what I'm trying to disentangle. Um, and you know, I, I guess I think there's always room for queer negativity, but I don't know exactly how you mean it. But obviously, it just shows up in all my work. So um, negativity in terms of like, you know. You can't find me because I don't belong with the states. So you can't discipline me. That's a form of creativity. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the sort of like, uh, you know, like uh, very um, fine.
findable form of abjection in the Stryker diary. So, you know, there's different things that people mean by that. Um, but, yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you, Heather, for a, a fantastic talk. Uh, just along the lines of what you've been talking about so far, I just wanted to ask you to say a few words, given that your your second section began with the citation from Testo Junkie yeah. about can the monster speak, which seems to engage in a sort of different way with the questions that you've been raising through Stryker's essay, yeah. and that, that has a, st I mean, it is also calling bullshit. I mean, it's it's calling bullshit on the whole psychoanalytic establishment on the one hand, yeah. and on the other hand, it's, it's it's strangely impersonal in a certain way, mm -hmm. um, as as opposed to the way in which Stryker appropriates the persona of the monster. So I just was it just seemed like a natural trajectory of your talk, and I was just wondering if you wanted to go there for a few minutes. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really gone there, so I don't I don't totally want to go there. But I mean, I think um, yeah, and I mean, I obviously you know was well not obviously, but I was thinking about you as I was reading my paper in terms of just going back to sex and the unbearable in those conversations about the sort of, um, you know, your, your, I think, quite profound critique of affect, which, you know, I hold in my mind, like, all the time now. 